Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to this, which is my daily driver, my 2005 V6 Porsche Cayenne. And it is now coming up, as you can see from the title of the video, to six months since I bought this car. And what I like to do, for better or for worse, at this sort of time period, is go through all of the costs associated with owning this car since I've bought it and get an idea of exactly what this has cost me to own because everyone likes to say with these types of cars, the 20 year old luxury cars that were once really expensive to buy new, they like to boo boo them and say that they're just ruinously expensive to run and not worth it. However, this morning I have gone through with a calculator. I've looked at exactly how many miles I've covered. I've looked at my insurance, the tax, the fuel, the maintenance I've had done on this car. And I found out how much it has cost me to run in six months. And I'm gonna go through that with you in detail in this video. And let me tell you, uh, I was genuinely, um, I was surprised at, at the result. So do stick around and watch that. But I thought what would be nice, as we haven't had this on the channel for a little while, is we'll, we'll go for a drive and I'll talk to you in that drive about the things that I have been enjoying with this car after six months and just over 6,000 miles in it. And some of the things that I've not been enjoying so much as well, a bit of a roundup of my experience with it over the last six months, potentially whether I'd be looking to move it on or to keep it as my daily driver for the time being. Without further ado then, let's jump in the KN, go for a little drive, and then we'll come back somewhere nice like this and go through the long list of numbers that I've got based on how much it has cost to run this car over the last six months. <laughs> So let me just start then with a general update on my car. So we've got this, the Porsche Cayenne, which is my daily driver. The Volvo XC90 that I spent a week in a workshop trying to get through its MOT. Well, I've still actually got that car. It is just sat on my parents' driveway. It's got a perfectly good MOT until I think the end of the year, but it still needs work to get going. And I've just run out of budget and mental capacity for that car but I also don't want to get rid of it. So that is just sat there. I know it's a bit wasteful. I should probably sort something out with that car. Then we've got the Jaguar S-Type, which is actually on the Isle of Wight with my parents-in-law. Uh, I did do a video update on that a few months back where we gave it a good old run, a good clean, and yeah, it was really enjoyable actually. But that car is still within the family, so to speak. It's just with my in-laws on the island. And then my Audi TT, the little red sports car I picked up on Copart for about 800 quid. I actually sold that to a friend of mine who I have to say, he's been absolutely loving it. Now, unfortunately for him, a few things went wrong on it not long after he bought it. And genuinely, hand on heart, it had been running pretty much impeccably the entire time that I'd owned the car, but he had to get a few bits sorted, had to spend seven or 800 quid, I think, on it, getting it back up to tip-top shape. But he's still got that Audi TT and he's absolutely loving it, which makes me very, very happy. And then, yes, we're left with the KN, which is basically my only car at the moment, and I use it every single day. And there is so much to like about this car. I think I've probably touched on some of these points in previous videos, but to recap, I do just love the way these things look, these 955 generation KNs. Now they're not timeless and almost pretty like an L322, I will admit, but I do think these have just aged quite nicely. I think you kind of love it or hate it with these KNs, whereas I think most people agree that a that boxy L322 is, is quite a good looking thing. These for me, I think at the front, you could almost call it pretty. And at the back, it's kind of brutish. And I, I like it with a quad exhaust and it has purpose. Uh, I do look back at the car most of the time when I get out of it, which yeah, I know it's a, an old SUV, but I'm a weird guy and I find interesting things quite nice to look at and this is no exception so i enjoy the way this thing looks i enjoy being inside the car the interior itself is not the nicest to look at but i do love the dials in a porsche any porsche the dials are a great feature of it and in the kn i love having my oil temperature on the left as well as my water temperature in the middle i really really enjoy that and just the rev counters and speedo 
are like what you'd have in a Boxster or a 911 from this generation. And I find that really cool. I find it comfortable to drive. The seating position is really good. You're nice and high up. I love the view you get out of the car. I love the big, chunky wing mirrors, the big, chunky grab handle. And I love the feel of the wheel and the fact that it's quite thinly rimmed. Also, the seats themselves are very comfortable, pretty soft, with plenty of adjustability on them, a really good bolster and lumbar support system, which means I never find myself becoming uncomfortable driving this thing. I like the subtle growl that this VR6 3.2 litre engine makes. From outside the car, it sounds absolutely fantastic. From inside, you just get a hint of that raspiness, but it's really nicely judged. And of course, it's just a daily driver SUV. You don't want it to be intrusive, but you still get a nice hint of that six cylinder noise when you put your foot down. I enjoy the versatility of this car. I like the fact that if you want to go on a bit of a B-Road blast, it's really good fun. No, it's no Boxster or 911, but it does a much better job, for example, than that L322 supercharged Range Rover I had on the channel a few weeks back. But at the same time, there's loads of space for passengers in the back, or as I have at the moment, stuff from my wife's office as we're relocating. So you can use it as a work van, but at the same time, you can have a bit of fun with it on a B road such as this. My particular car has a Apple CarPlay system which was retrofitted by the previous owner and it's absolutely wonderful to have. I never would have thought in a car of this age I would have such a seamless infotainment system. It's wireless Apple CarPlay so I get in the car with my phone and that's all I have to do. Everything is on here, my satellite navigation, my music, my podcast, whatever you want, just like a brand new car is fantastic and I would go as far as to say that this works probably better and more seamlessly than most of the Apple CarPlay systems in newer cars that I get to test. That for me is a real game changer in my daily driver and in fact I don't think I could go to something now that doesn't have Apple CarPlay. And for me in my daily driver I spend quite a lot of time behind the wheel of my cars and I do also spend quite a lot of time on what I'd call frustrating roads such as the M25. And I never really want to be in a car that's sporty or fast or aggressive on roads like those. I want to be in something like this that kind of relaxes you and allows you to just be happy to go with the flow. So in traffic on the M25, this is one of those cars where you just sort of sit back, relax, and you sit in lane one and just let it all blow over. Whereas in sportier cars, I find myself being too eager to get places and potentially just tiring myself out before I even get there. Whereas what I'm trying to say is when you go somewhere in the KN, you always arrive quite relaxed and it's one of those cars that you don't really want to get out of once you do arrive at your destination. One other thing just on the infotainment system that I love with this car is the sound system. It has the Bose sound system from factory, but I guess they just can't make sound systems all that much better because this one is very, very good you would almost certainly burst your eardrums trying to reach the full potential of this sound system. But at the same time, as well as making music sound incredible, it means, again, listening to podcasts on longer journeys, just much easier and more relaxing. I could probably go on for a while longer and talk about many of the other things that I enjoy with this KM, but there's one that's probably the best of all, which I've not actually mentioned yet. And we'll talk about this in depth when we look at costs later on. But dependability and reliability. I, dare I say it, in touch words, this has been one of the most dependable slash reliable cars I've ever owned. And it's literally had no issues whatsoever. I did have an engine light that was coming on, but it would clear. And now that I've had the catalytic converter sealed up and sorted, I've not had that engine light back, which is great. It was also a little bit noisy because of that, but again, that was nothing wrong with the car. It was just one of those things that needed sorting. I do feel like I could just jump in this car and drive to Scotland without having to worry about whether it's gonna get me there or not. It doesn't have that same anxiety-inducing feeling that you get with a L322 Range Rover where you're wondering when the next warning light's gonna come on. It doesn't have that at all. I really do depend and rely and trust this car. And that, to be honest, wasn't something I was expecting going into KN ownership. I was expecting it to be quite problematic. So I think I can quite confidently say that this has been one of the best cars that I've actually ever owned. And I would probably say it's the favorite daily driver that I've ever owned because it has been so dependable 
but also enjoyable every time that I drive it. However, one thing it hasn't been particularly is cheap. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail once we get the notepad out with all the numbers. But if I may just mention a few things that aren't so great, I have spoken about these before, but the ride quality, although the chair I'm sat in is very comfortable, the ride is hard. And I really noticed that when I got into that L322 a few weeks ago. It's set up like a sports car. It rides like a Boxster. It's very, very firm. And 90% of the time, I would prefer it to be softer. Now, it's not been so bad that I've wanted to sell the car, but even changing the wheels from 20 inches to 18 hasn't made it as, as soft as I would like. It is very firm. Also, the fuel economy. Now, I love to think of myself as a pro economical driver. I've driven all sorts of silly cars much further than they should be able to go on one tank of fuel. However, this car frustrates me because no matter what I do, I cannot get this to read any sort of acceptable figures whatsoever. My long-term average with this is 21 miles per gallon. And that is a pretty hard pill to swallow when it is your daily driver. However, the thing that really frustrates me is no matter how hard I try, I can't get it to be like 30 miles per gallon on a run or 28 even. The best I can ever, ever get out of this thing is 25, maybe 26 miles per gallon. And that kind of hurts a little bit. Now I've had plenty of cars that get that sort of fuel economy, if not worse, before this as my daily driver. My 7 Series, my V12 7 Series, was my daily driver for a time, but that would get 27 or 28 miles per gallon on a run, and it was fast. My L322 Range Rover averaged around 18, but if you really tried, you could also get 26 or 27 mpg out of that, and it was quicker than this car. Now this thing is really quite slow, and yet, no matter how hard I try, I can't get that to read anything more than about 25 miles per gallon. So if it was faster, I don't think I'd mind so much, but the fact that it is a pretty slow car and it still returns those dismal figures, uh, that's probably the worst thing about this. So what I'd like to do now then is actually talk in depth about how much money this has cost me to run because as I mentioned at the start of the video, I did all these numbers early on today and I was pretty shocked at the results and it got me thinking really if I'm, I'm doing this all wrong and if I'm making a big mistake by running an old car like this as a daily driver. But let me pull over and explain what I mean by all of this and maybe you guys can help me in the comments weigh up what I should be doing, whether this is indeed a really poor decision to be using this as a daily driver, or if actually I'm just getting confused and it still works out quite nicely. So now that we've pulled over then, let me run you through these numbers that I worked out on uh, my phone this morning. It took me a while because there's quite a lot that goes into it you don't always realise. So first and foremost, we bought this car just under six months ago and I've done six and a half thousand miles in it. That's going to be important for later on when we calculate cost per mile, etc. First thing, of course, that you have to pay for with any car in this country is insurance. And on this, it's about £900 per year. Or if we go over six months, we can halve that and say £450. So there's the first thing. The tax then on this car, I actually pay monthly for that, is £35 per month. So six months, I believe that is £175 uh, at £35 a month. And then as we've covered 6,500 miles, I wanted to work out how much money I would have spent on fuel. Now this will be give or take a few hundred quid, I'd imagine. But as uh, a rough average to calculate, my average with this long term is 21 miles per gallon. And I'd say fuel is about £1.50 a litre. Now every three tanks or so, I like to put Shell V power in. So I've averaged it down to about £1.50 a litre because that's probably 165. And generally the supermarket fuel is about £1.40. Obviously that's always changing, but I think that's pretty representative over the last six months. So at £1.50 a litre uh, for 1,405 litres of fuel, which is what we would have used at 21 miles per gallon for six and a half thousand miles, uh, that comes out at £2,107.50, which 
I was actually a little bit surprised about. I thought it was going to be quite a lot more than that. I guess I feel like I'm always at the filling station with this thing, but I suppose I'm not always spending over £100. I might just be topping it up and spending 50 or 60 at times. Uh, but I did expect that to be a lot higher. And so that's a good thing, I suppose. However, then if you do average that out and work out the monthly cost, you then find out that's about £350 per month in fuel, which all of a sudden now sounds like a lot of money because I'm forgetting that this is just over six months and not even a year. Then servicing repairs. So I think this depends on the owner, but I'm a very pernickety owner. I'm quite a perfectionist. I like my cars, especially the ones I'm using every day, to be perfect. And uh, I think you can get these 20 year old Porsches perfect, but it does require some effort and some money. And as you've seen, I've spent quite a lot of time down at ePorsche getting this car right. So when I first bought the car, as I would pretty much do with anything, I took it in for a service. Uh, this is actually just an oil change, but there was also a couple of little bits like the rear windscreen wiper wasn't working or it was falling off, I think. And so I got the guys at ePorsche to do a full inspection, do an oil change, get that wiper sorted, and so that we could come back and make a plan for any other repairs that they found. Now, luckily they didn't find all that much, but there was a relatively long list of things that they did say needed sorting, like the belt, like the brake boost pipe, and the catalytic converter was obviously loose, as we mentioned earlier. And there was a few other bits too, which we'll get to in a second. But that I paid £350 for that full inspection and service. And then, of course, I changed the wheels on this car. So I did have 20 inch wheels with uh, the tyres are actually OK. There was no need to change them. So this cost essentially it's a modification cost. And I'm not sure it really counts. But for reference, I paid Alex, Auto Alex, £100 for his set, his spare set of 18 inch wheels. And then uh, it was £700 to get the Michelin uh, all season. Are they Michelins? I've forgotten now. They're Michelin cross climate twos, I think, on the car. So I got them for the winter. And actually, I've been thinking lately about switching back to the 20 inch wheels because I did change mainly because of the ride quality, but I kind of just accepted that it's quite firm now. And with the 20 inch wheels, the handling is, is a lot a lot more communicative and responsive and I quite enjoy and, and miss that. So yeah, it was 700 quid for the tires, 100 pounds for the wheels. So 800 pounds all in. I guess you could argue that I could set sell my, my 20 inch set for maybe three or 400 pounds. Um, but actually coming to think of it, that is a bit of a, of a optional cost. I, I wanted to have two sets of wheels for this car. I had planned on taking it into Europe in the winter. Um, as you can probably tell, oh dear. I had planned on taking this car into Europe during the winter, which is why I needed the all season tires, but it ended up taking so long to get that all sorted that I basically ran out of time to do a winter trip in this car. So although these tires are really good um, and I paid a lot of money for them, I might switch them back to the twenties. But anyway, that was 800 pounds to have the wheels. And then, of course, I went back to ePorsche about a month ago now to get the list of things that we'd found sorted. So that was, I'm going to go through my list on here because I always forget. We had the, the belt, so the drive belt, the tensioner, the alternator pulley, the catalytic converter, the brake boost pipe and a gearbox service, which probably, again, wasn't an essential thing, but I do like to make sure I'm doing all the maintenance I can possibly do. So all of that work came to about £1,200, which means that and the service, um, 1,550 quid is basically what I've spent on maintaining the car in six months. Thing is though, I'd like to think that most of that stuff, so the, the belt, the alternator pulley, the tensioner, the catalytic converter repair, the brake boost pipe, that's all stuff that's not going to need doing again next year. That should last, you know, 10 years minimum, those sorts of things. Same with the gearbox service, I think 60,000 miles. So for me, probably another five years before I'd have to consider doing a gearbox service. So when we do average these costs out over six months, bear that in mind because it's inflated at the moment because I bought the car recently and wanted to get a bunch of preventative and, and essential maintenance done. So 1,550 quid plus the wheels takes us to 2,350 pounds that I've sort of spent on this car. There's a few tiny bits here and there. I had a, pretty much every single bulb on the car went, so I probably spent about 50 quid on bulbs. 
and various tiny little things, but I'll leave them out. And so if we total all of that up then, the insurance cost at £450, the tax at 175 the fuel at £2,107.50, service and wipe repair at £350, gearbox service and repairs at £1,200, the winter wheels and tyres at £800. That gives us a grand total, and this is the number that actually shot me, of £5,082.50. And if you divide that by six to give you the monthly cost, £847 a month, which also works out based on 6,500 miles, at 78 pence per mile. And that doesn't include, of course, the purchase price of the car, which was 3,800 pounds. Now that really shocked me because I, like any person, is always looking through Auto Trader, and Auto Trader is always showing you like the next best thing, like the 30, 40 grand stuff. And it always shows you the finance figure next, next to the listing. And I've seen that I could get an L405 five litre supercharged Range Rover from 2017, 2018, for about £599 a month. And then when I saw £847 a month just on the running costs of this car, I was thinking, what on earth am I doing? I should be, I should be financing a, a Jaguar F-Type or like an Audi R8 or something I could get for about £800 a month. And so now it's just put me into this little bit of a spin really where I think, gosh, am I being absolutely crazy paying £850 a month to run this KN, which is great and I, I love it, don't get me wrong, but there's much greater and better and newer cars out there that can be had for a lot less than that. The thing is though, say I do go and finance a newer Porsche Cayenne, a 35 grand car that's 500 pounds a month, I still have to pay for tax, which will be probably a little bit less actually, around 190 pounds for the year. The fuel, I still have to pay for, but on a newer three litre, uh, v6 one of, of these a 2017 car they can get about 37 miles per gallon so it'll almost be twice as economical and therefore the fuel cost in six months would go down by about a thousand pounds or about 175 pounds per month then the servicing repairs it probably cost more like 500 quid for an oil service uh, a specialist on one of them or 600 for like a major but i'm not going to have to fork out for a catalytic converter that's leaking or a brake boost pipe that's split probably on a seven or six year old car and when i worked it all out like a finance example on a 35 grand 2017 kn about 550 quid a month the fuel being a little bit less the insurance i actually looked at was a tiny bit more 1100 pounds for the year it came out to about a thousand and fifty pounds per month all in over six months the thing is though, most of these finance agreements are like four years. And the thing is with this car, I'm quite simply not tied into it in any way. I own this car. If I want to sell it at any point, I can without any penalties. And I know you can exit financial agreements, but you're paying interest every month that you have the car. And there is the chance that when you do sell it, you could end up with negative equity and having to not only lose your deposit but pay more to get out of the car it's complicated it's not quite as freeing as owning a car like this outright and the thing is actually if i sold this car tomorrow based on how well it's been looked after and looking at the rest of the market i think i realistically could get around four and a half to five thousand pounds for it so essentially a little bit of a profit on the purchase price of the car so if you did say sell this car for five grand and he took that £1,200 profit off these monthly figures, uh, the total cost uh, would have come to £3,882 over six months, or £647 a month, or 59 pence a mile, which sounds already a lot better. That is assuming I'd sell the car for five grand. I have actually been offered quite a lot more than that by some of you crazy people. Um, so I think it's not completely unfeasible to expect to get that sort of money for it if I sold it. But I think the best thing probably to do at the moment, given this, is to hold on to it for a bit longer. Because if I keep the car for another six months and do the same miles in it, pay the same for insurance, obviously pay the same for tax, but don't have to do any further servicing or repairs, which I shouldn't have to do at least for a year, even just another six months brings that monthly cost to 551 a month, which already sounds a lot better considering I don't have essentially money tied up into this car other than what I 
bought it for and I think I could probably get that money back and maybe a little bit on top too. So yeah, they're the figures that I found uh, this morning and I was a little bit surprised. I wasn't expecting £850 a month, but of course I had to spend quite a lot of money up front getting this thing to the standard that I want. And like I've said now, it is perfect. I'm not just saying that, it's fantastic this thing. Not economical at all, but very comfortable, very reliable uh, and brilliant for what I need right now. And also I know that I can sell it and get my money back less all of those costs so yeah there's a lot of numbers i'm totally confused actually i'd love to hear your opinions do you think i'm completely mental and is there just another two thousand pound bill around the corner that i'm gonna have to fork out for or is this just like economies of scale in the sense where i could keep this car now for three or four years and fingers crossed with all that preventative stuff i've done apart from maybe 500 quid a year on servicing, it should be pretty good. And then that monthly cost would come right down. But the truth of it is that the fuel is the biggie there and the fuel is something I can't do anything about. So yeah, I'm in a bit of a conundrum really. I, I planned on selling this car now that we're moving into the spring summer um, to get something a little bit more sporty. But I've also just bought a house with my wife and I'm not sure I'm gonna quite be able to do that. So I decided I'm just gonna keep this thing, um, use it as a daily driver, do lots more reviews. Uh, I've been doing lots of brutally honest reviews. So I'm gonna be doing more of them because there's only so many things I can talk about with this KN. So just keep the KN for a while, use it as my daily driver. Maybe it'll take a bit of a backseat on YouTube. But then I saw these numbers and I thought, oh my goodness, do I change it for something else? But I don't know what. Do I go and finance a car? No idea. So yeah, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and opinions. Let me know what you have, what you drive, and let me know what it costs you to run them if you want to. Also, if you're a KN owner, hopefully this is sort of the ballpark of what you're paying, or hopefully for you a little bit, you're paying a bit less than this. I found that very, very eye-opening and interesting and wanted to share it with you guys. So I don't think there was anything more I wanted to add. I did also have a quick look at like leasing a car, because I know when you lease, a brand new car, you can get it included with servicing and, and all the costs, basically insurance and tax. And I looked at that, but again, you had to pay quite a lot of money up front for something equivalent to this. I was looking at a VW Tiguan, a new one, and it came up at 600 pounds a month, which is great, but you had to put 6,000 pounds in and you had to commit to that for four years. So obviously over four years, what's that? For 28,800 pounds plus your 6K deposit, 35 grand, you know, I'm not going to spend 35 grand on this thing unless I keep it for a long time. So yeah, that's where I'm at really. Thought that was eye-opening, so I had to share it. Anyway, I hope you found this video enjoyable. Do you think I should sell this car, quit while I'm ahead, while it's all running perfectly? It's in basically spot-on condition. Should I sell it, take a little bit of a profit, or should I just keep it? The longer I keep it, surely the cheaper it gets every month. The fuel is just the only thing I'm, I'm not sure about. It is quite bad. Yeah, well, please do comment below and let me know your thoughts. Thank you all so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one next week very, very soon.